about that time. Welcome to the Word of the Day. Thank you for joining me this holiday. And today, let's take a look at how much God truly loves all mankind. In For God So Loved the World. Journey with me to Mount Calvary where the spotless lamb died for all mankind. As the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give their account of the crucifixion and the resurrection. If you have not done so already, please consider subscribing to this channel. Now Jesus spent three successive years performing miracles and teaching of the kingdom of God. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, but they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, and Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Toward the last days of the Lord Jesus walked the earth, days before Jesus' death, he was leading up to his crucifixion and he was subtly telling the disciples about it. You know that the Passover takes place after two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be killed to be crucified. For this is the plan of God. Now the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival day, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Now while Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster box of very expensive ointment, which she poured out on his head as he was reclining at a table. When the disciples saw this, they were very indignant, angry. Why are you wasting the oil? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of what this meant, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me here with you. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. What are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared for the Passover. Now, if we travel back through time to the life of the patriarch Jacob, Israel became slaves in Egypt. Joseph was a governor in Egypt after Joseph and Jacob's death, all Israel became Egypt's slaves for 400 years after that. So in order for the Lord to save his people Israel, he raised up the prophet Moses to be a deliverer to free the Israelites from the land of Egypt. So through the prophet Moses, God executed 10 plagues or judgments on Egypt to compel the Pharaoh, King Ramesses II, to release Israel from slavery. With the first nine plagues, the Pharaoh just hardened his heart against Israel. But with the 10th plague, all the fighting of Pharaoh was gone. So 10 plagues that the Lord used to force the Pharaoh's hand in order to get him to release the children of Israel was this. He turned water into blood, so Egypt had no water to drink in the land. But in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites stayed, there was water. Two, the plague of frogs. He sent a multitude of frogs into Egypt. 
Then it was the plague of lice, then flies, then pestilence of the livestock and all the livestock died. Then it was boils where they had boils on their skin. Then it was hail, then it was locusts, then it was darkness for three days. And the 10th plague, the 10th plague was all the firstborn children would die. This 10th plague is where we get the Passover from. The Lord passed over Egypt and killed all the firstborn of the children. So God dispatched his destroyer to go through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn in the land. So the children of the nation of Israel would not die. The Lord told Moses to tell every household in Israel to sacrifice a lamb and to apply the blood of the lamb on their doorposts of their houses where they stayed. They were also instructed not to eat anything that was leavened, meaning that what would cause dough to rise. Now, the night when the destroyer came through the land of Egypt to smite all the firstborn was called the Passover. It was a night when the Lord passed over, and when the angel saw the blood on the doors, he would not destroy the firstborn in that house. This is in Exodus 12 and 13, which states, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over, and no destructive plague will touch you when I smite the land of Egypt. So as a result, all the firstborn of Egypt died that night, that one night revealed to Israel and to Egypt the power of God. So after the story of the Lord passed over the nation of Egypt, all the children who were firstborn died, even in the household of Pharaoh. Now Israel ate the Seder as the destroyer passed over. The Seder is a ritual dinner, so because of that night, the Pharaoh freed Israel from slavery. The Pharaoh literally drove them out quickly. They grabbed everything they had and quickly left the land of Egypt. So now Jesus' last supper with the disciples during Passover represents that he becomes the sacrificial lamb that Israel would sacrifice and apply the blood to their houses. What houses are we applying it to? Our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temples or house of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. So now during the time of Jesus, he instructs his disciples to go and prepare for the Passover. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepare for the Passover. Now the preparation for the Passover is generally this in modern times. Number one, the first step is to clean the entire house. Number two, the house must also be completely free of hammocks, which is any grain that has been in contact with water for more than 18 minutes. Why? Because after 18 minutes, the leavening process begins. Remember in Egypt, they could not eat anything that had been leavened. No cakes, cookies, bread bread is allowed during Passover in modern times, for 11 products must be avoided during Passover. This is because of how quickly the nation of Israel had to leave Egypt and without having time to let their dough rise. Number three, they have to make sure that all utensils and dishes that had come in contact with any leavened food are washed. Then during the first night of the Passover was the Seder and a reading of the Haggadah. The Haggadah is a Jewish text that tells the story of Israel's deliverance from the land of Egypt. According to Jewish practice, reading the Haggadah at the Seder table is a fulfillment of mitzvah to each Jew to tell their children the story from the book of Exodus about God's bringing the Israelites out of slavery, out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Now when the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and upset and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is decreed. 
but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had never been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny knowing me three times. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. Sit here while I go over here and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, along with him. And he began to be very sorrowed and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus wanted the other disciples, the three men, to pray with him so that he would not fall into temptation, that he would have the strength to do what he knows he needs to do. As it is written, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he turned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch and pray with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that I will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Can we really sweat drops of blood? The answer is yes, yes we can. There is a rare medical term called hemothidrosis. It's a rare medical phenomenon that's been reported about 12 to 14 times in the world and is seen only in people who are under tremendous stress and agony. A person actually exudes blood from every sweat gland in their body. Every sweat gland has a small capillary that surrounds it and in hemothidrosis the small capillary ruptures. As it bursts, a person actually bleeds into their sweat glands. Instead of perspiring sweat, they perspire blood. The Bible gives an excellent description of this phenomenon, saying that the Lord's sweat became like blood, as great drops of blood. Indeed, every pore of Jesus' body oozed and drained blood. Even though Christ was God, he was also in the body of a man. He knew the level of pain and torture he would have to endure for all mankind. Jesus then went back to the three, and when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes looked heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. When he had finished praying, then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes the one who will betray me. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. 
Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked, Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the word he, he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Now Judas had arranged a signal with them. He told them, the one that I kiss on the cheek is the man you want. Arrest him. Judas walked up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Master. And Judas kissed the Lord. Judas, you are betraying the Son of Man with a kiss. Do what you came to do, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Then suddenly Peter reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Peter, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? No more of this! Do you think I couldn't pray to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? This I say, it must happen in this way. Consider that a Roman legion at its full strength is 6,000 soldiers. Jesus is saying God the Father could send 72,000 angels to defend him if he asked. And Jesus touched the soldier Malchus' head and the man's ear was healed. Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. This is your hour, when darkness reigns. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled, just as Jesus had prophesied. Then the detachment of soldiers with his commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law to Caiaphas the high priest. Caiaphas was one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. The teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. Another disciple was following also because this other disciple was known by the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the gate. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty at the gate, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She said to Peter, he replied, I am not. He went into the courtyard of the high priest to see the outcome. It was cold and the, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, they questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent Jesus bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing by the fire, warming himself. So they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? I am not. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence in order to put Jesus to death. But they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him. But the statements did not agree. Then someone stood up and gave a false testimony again. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another, not made with hands. 
Then their testimony still did not agree. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so. But I say to all of you, I am. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. We don't need any more witnesses. Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death. Then they spit in his face, struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? And while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I swear I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, which was one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then Peter began to curse and he swore to them, I swear I don't know the man! Immediately a rooster crowed, and then Jesus turned around and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words that Jesus had prophesied to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter ran outside and wept bitterly. Very early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin had made their plans. Then Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace, because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked them, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law but we have no right to execute anyone. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death that he must endure. When Judas, who had betrayed him, when he saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And the chief priests and the elders said to him, What is that to us? That is your responsibility. So Judas cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and ran out and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver and the pieces and said, It is not lawful to put this money back into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And the chief priests took counsel together and bought with the silver the potter's field for the burial of strangers, criminals, and the poor. In the Greek it is called ekodama which means the field of blood. Then what was spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field. Meanwhile, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But no, my kingdom is from another place. Are you a king then? You have said it. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? With this, Pilate went back outside to the Jews gathered there. I find no basis for a charge against this man. Then Pilate went back inside to Jesus. Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not a single word. In great amazement of the governor, now a man called Barabbas was a prisoner with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did.
It was a custom for the governor to release one prisoner at the time of Passover. Which one of these men do you want me to release to you? Jesus or Barabbas? Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas, a murderer. They shouted back and they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Crucify him. Crucify him. While Pilate was sitting in the judge's chair, his wife sent him a message in order to speak with him. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal earlier in a dream because of him. Understand this, God speaks to us through dreams and visions. Job 33, 14 and 17 says this, For God speaks once, yes, even twice, yet men perceive it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, and slumbering upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals his instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose, or what they are purposed to do, and hide pride from man. So God speaks to us through our dreams and visions. So Pilate's wife, did so so that the blame would not be placed on the governor, but blame would be placed on the people that asked that Jesus die. Pilate therefore wanted to release Jesus and spoke to them again, but the crowd cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said to them a third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death. I will therefore flog him and let him go. The crowd became even louder, requiring that he be crucified. And the voices of the crowd and the chief priests prevailed, for they were even more fierce. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all the Jews, beginning in Galilee, to this very place. When Pilate heard of them mention Galilee, he asked them whether the man was from Galilee. As soon as he determined that Jesus belonged to King Herod's jurisdiction in Galilee, he sent him to King Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he desired to see Jesus for a very long time, because he had heard the many things Jesus had done, and he hoped to see some miracle that Jesus might perform. Then he questioned Jesus a long time, but Jesus answered him nothing. Then the chief priests and the scribes stood fiercely, accused Jesus before Herod. But Herod, with his man of war, disregarded Jesus and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to the governor, Pontius Pilate. That day, Pilate and Herod were friendly toward each other. Before, they were at odds with each other, but this day, they were on the same side. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You have brought this man to me as one that perverts the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man. Herod examined those things which you accuse him of also. Herod did not find any fault with Jesus. That is why he sent this man back. For I sent you to him. And look, nothing he has done is worthy of death. While Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. How ironic that here the people ask that Christ's blood be upon them and upon their children. Of course the Jewish leaders at this time did not mean to imply that Jesus' blood would atone for them, but the symbolic nature of their words and that they chose still remains true. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Unknowingly, they are asking that Jesus' blood atone for all. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over. 
to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on Jesus, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! A crown of thorns was woven together and placed on Jesus' head. But what you may not realize is that the thorns in Israel can be from a half an inch to two inches long. They are not the, like the thorns on a rose from the florist. These thorns in Israel are razor sharp. The custom was to drive the thorns into the skull of the victim and then tap on the top of the head, just a form of torture to add to the victim. Understand that the scalp is the most vascular portion of our bodies. It has a huge blood supply. So then having those thorns shoved down into Jesus' skull onto the bony plate of his skull would have gone through all the skin and scalp, which in and of itself would have created a huge amount of blood loss. People have actually bled to death from just a scalp injury alone, so this is not a small injury to have dozens of spikes shoved into your scalp. Then they put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Not only must Jesus go through the pain, but the added humiliation of mockery, the price of a sinner's death. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Remember, the crown of thorns is still on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. The word scourge comes from the French word the scourger, which means to whip. The scourge was a horrific torture that was forbidden to be inflicted on Roman citizens. Scourging was reserved for foreigners and traitors. It was the worst punishment the Romans could inflict on a human body. The criminal was stripped completely naked and tied to a low post or wall with his back exposed. He was whipped from his shoulders to the bottoms of his feet. If you can imagine two large, strong Roman soldiers with a wooden-handled whip, about 18 inches long, that had nine leather straps attached to it. The nine leather straps were six to seven feet long. Remember, it is a whip with pieces of typically metal, sometimes bone, sometimes pieces of porcelain wrapped in these leather straps, which is used to strike across the back and the shoulders and the legs of the victim. The first pass across the body would tear through the skin, then the fat and eventually the outer layers were torn away as you start getting at the muscle and the tendons. Of course, along the way, you're ripping through all the blood vessels that supply blood to all these tissues, and so you're losing blood. As the Roman soldiers flicked their wrists, they would literally pull pieces of flesh from the skin, leaving small pieces of muscle hanging from the victim's body. One lash from the strap would make a cut one and a half to two inches long. So with one lash of the Roman's whip, it would leave nine lacerations on the skin of the victim. Remember, there are nine straps. Now imagine being whipped 39 times. This is the average number of a victim of scourging to be whipped. So a lot of the time, scourging could disfigure or even kill the victim. A skilled Roman soldier could literally pull muscle from the victim. 39 lashes could literally shred human skin. This gives you an idea of the physical trauma that was inflicted on the Lord Jesus just from the scourging alone. We haven't even gotten to the crucifixion. This alone should put anyone in awe of the love of God has for mankind. Why didn't Jesus bleed to death? Because the cold of the night air would cause his blood vessels and capillaries to constrict, would lessen the blood flow.
As Jesus carried the cross, he became so exhausted that he eventually stumbled and fell. Unable to stand up, typically a person carries the actual cross to his death. In Roman writings, it says they carry the crossbar that is estimated alone by itself to weigh about 110 pounds. So as Jesus fell, as the soldiers were going out, a certain man from Cyrene named Simon was passing by. So the soldiers forced Simon to carry the cross walking behind Jesus. There were two other men led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the men, one on his right and one on his left. The place is also called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The cross is in two parts. First, the crossbar, from historical accounts, can be estimated to weigh 110 pounds and five to six feet long. Let us remember that this is not finished wood, but a jacket, rugged cross with splinters in it. The custom was to tie the crossbar to the victim and have him carry it through the city from the point of condemnation to the point of execution. Part of the custom was that many times the people would be forced to stagger through the streets after being scourged and beaten with the crossbar tied to their arm and to add to the ultimate humiliation, the victim must bear the cross naked. So imagine how humiliating this would be during this time in history. I can only imagine how humiliating and agonizing it must have been for the Lord of glory. The other part of the cross was an upright part that was posted in the ground. Someone condemned to crucifixion would bear the crossbar through the streets to the point outside the city, and once there, they would be thrown to the ground, and then come the nails. The nails, which were approximately six inches long and a quarter of an inch thick, the nail was driven through Jesus' hands into the crossbar, and then a piece of wood would be taken and put underneath Jesus' feet on the crossbar. So they would prop his feet up on that piece of wood, and then they would nail the spikes through his feet through that piece of wood that they put up under his feet. The Romans practiced crucifixions for hundreds of years, and they perfected the art of pain and suffering. How could a man have spikes driven through his hands and his feet and not bleed out rapidly to death? Well, I'll tell you. The Romans figured out that if you drove a spike through a man's wrist right in the middle, they could avoid hitting any arteries and veins, any major arteries and veins. And if you go back and look at the Hebrew word for hand, it's inclusive from the fingertips to where the wristband crosses your wrist. So the hand didn't necessarily mean the palm. You cannot drive a spike through a man's palm and hang him by it without the weight of his body pulling down his hand off the nail right through his fingers. The weight of his body will pull his hands right through it. It is a medical fact that the muscle in the palm of the hand is not strong enough to support the body weight. In order to be able to drive a spike through the Lord's hands, it had to be driven through the base of his hand, where it connects the hand and the wrist. There is a strong ligament called the transcarpal ligament that is strong enough to support the body weight, which is where we get carpal tunnel from when people are typing and get carpal tunnel syndrome. The Romans figured out that if they came to where the crease in the wrist is, where you put your wristband, and spike to spike through there, they would miss the radial artery, the artery that people cut when they commit suicide, right where the doctor takes the pulse. They would drive the spike through the biggest nerve in the hand called the median nerve. Now when the median nerve is pierced, the sensation is like an electric shock going through your hand and it caused the fingers to curl. The Romans figured out how 
in essence, to spike through a man's hand without having rapid blood loss, while maximizing the amount of pain and suffering that that man would endure. The Romans did the same thing to the feet. They calculated where they could drive a spike through a, both a man's feet and not cause rapid blood loss that would cause a victim to bleed to death in minutes, but would prolong his suffering. They would place the spike between the first and second metal tarsal bones, which is between the second and third uh, toe on the foot, missing the dorsal artery. There again, they drive the spike through the feet without rapid blood loss, and the spike misses the artery but does hit the plantar nerve, thereby causing the same horrific shock sensation. Now, we must remember that this is a sinner's death. This is the death that we deserve. But because God's great love and his mercy, he set in place a divine plan. He knew that Adam would sin and still he gave him the choice. So the sovereign Lord decided to step out of the portals of eternity, take on the flesh of a man while he was here, perform hundreds of notable miracles. They said too many to put into the book, the Bible, and then go to a sinner's death so you wouldn't have have to. This gives us an idea of how passionate God is about reconciling man back to himself. The position of Jesus hanging on the cross, he did not have trouble breathing in. His problem was exhaling. The tough part for Jesus on the cross was breathing out. In order for Jesus to breathe out, he would have to pull up on this nail, the spikes in his hands, and he would have to push up on the spikes in his feet. And I want you to remind you that he is hanging on a jagged, rugged cross, so his shredded and lacerated back from being whipped is scraping up and down on that jagged cross. Each time he breathes out, each time he utters a word and has to exhale by pulling himself up and lifting himself up on his feet to every word he spoke on the cross was excruciating pain. That is why he could only say a few words at a time. It is said that people hung on the cross for up to six days. And if you can imagine a, ha a man hanging on a cross outside the city gates while birds pecking at their eyes, even though they didn't peck at Jesus' eyes. Naked, he is a spectacle for the whole city to see. That was the point of it. It was the part of the shame and humiliation that a man hung there so people could come by day after day, stand and mock and jeer and throw accusations and railings and blasphemies at him. The idea was to make the person suffer as much as humanly possible. Crucifixion's primary motive was to exact as much pain and suffering as humanly possible. When they had crucified him, they took his clothes divided them into four shares, one for each of the guards, but his armor garment was so skillfully made that they cast lots for his undergarment because it was, it, it was an expensive garment, it was seamless. So the soldiers cast the lots to see which one would get it. Now Pilate, who didn't believe that Jesus should die, had a sign made and nailed it above his head. It was in Greek and Latin and Hebrew, and it said, This is the King of the Jews. The chief priests and the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. But Pilate said, What I have said is what I have said. Jesus said while on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the people stood beholding him. The two criminals crucified next to him, one on the right, one on the left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, taking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross, if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Even the criminal next to him mocked him. 
and the soldiers also mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. But the criminal, If you be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other criminal rebuked, Don't you fear God, seeing you are also condemned? We deserve this condemnation, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing. The man said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. From noon until 3 p.m., darkness came over the land. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, John, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. From that time after, John took her into his home. At noon, darkness came over the whole land at the ninth hour, which is three o'clock p.m., and there was an eclipse of the sun. The sun went black. Now imagine the sky goes totally black as if it is night, as Jesus is drawing his last breath. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani. Which being interpreted is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or in other words, why have you withdrawn yourself from me? Remember that God the Father cannot have any parts with sin. And since Jesus became sin and stood in the gap for all mankind, God the Father withdrew from him. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling on Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus' wine to drink, mixed with gall. Gall is a substance made from myrrh, which was mixed into a wine and offered to Jesus. Jesus tasted it and realized that the concoction was designed to dull his senses and ease some of the pain from his crucifixion. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. The people said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, Jesus said, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said that, he bowed his head, breathed his last breath, and he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this is a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the thing which had happened, struck their chests and returned. And all his disciples and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be the Sabbath, the special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who was crucified with Jesus and then those of the other man that was on the other side of Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. When the Romans grew tired and wanted to expedite death, they would simply break the legs of the victim, causing the victim to suffocate in a matter of minutes because you can't push up with your legs in order to breathe out. This is called crucifractrum. The two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus, the Roman guards broke their legs in order to kill them. But when they came to the Lord, he was already dead. Jesus did not die of this because it is written that no bone in his body was broken. Jesus' life was not taken from him. He laid it down. John 10 and 18 says, As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. 
No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This is the commandment I have received of the Father. The Lord was dead already, so the Roman centurion thrust a spear in his side to confirm his death. Zechariah 12 and 10 says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man is the son of God. And this was an unbeliever who instantly believed. There was a total eclipse of the sun during his death. And the darkness could not have been a regular eclipse because the moon cannot intervene between the earth and the sun when the sun is at its full brilliance. This darkness was by the hand of God. There was an earthquake. The rocks split and tombs broke and opened up. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and John, Mary the mother of Jesus and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now when the soldiers pierced Jesus in his side, they brought forth a sudden rush of uh, blood and water. The man who saw it gave this testimony. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may know and believe. These things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So later, Joseph of Arimathea, he was not one of the men that sought to crucify Jesus, for he also himself waited for the kingdom of God. He begged Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion who was standing at the feet of Jesus, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea. He came and took the body away. He was accompanied by, by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and its strips of linen at the place where Jesus was crucified. There was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. They placed his body in the tomb Joseph of Arimathea had previously cut out of a rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and they went away. And, the, and that day was the preparation of the Sabbath. And the women also, which came with Jesus from Galilee, followed after them and watched where he was buried at and how he was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ornaments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, We remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be guarded until the third day, otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard. Go. Make the tomb as secure as you know how.
So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal around the stone and posting the guard. Now very early, the first day of the week, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, who was Mary's sister, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body just, just after sunrise. They were on their way to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for the fear of the angel, the guards that were guarding the tomb were shaken and became like dead men. As the women were walking, they said, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Little did they know it had already been rolled away. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes and gleaming like lightning stood beside them. In their fear and fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered Jesus' words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven disciples that were there. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother James, and other women with them. And they told this to the other disciples. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to be nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. He went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Now, that same day, two other disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other uh, about everything that had happened. As they walked and discussed things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along beside them, but their eyes were shielded so they didn't realize it was him. He asked them, what are you talking about? They stood still. Their faces looked sorrowful. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these past few days? What things? About Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And also it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going somewhere else. But they urged him strongly, saying, saying to him, Please stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went and stayed with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he broke it and gave thanks and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he uh, disappeared out of their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened to us the scriptures? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. 
There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread before them. They returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those things that had been seen by others. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side where his side was pierced. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord Jesus and Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, your sins will be forgiven. But if you don't forgive other people their sins, your sins won't be forgiven. The bodies of many holy people who had died resurrected when Jesus resurrected. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared to many people. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve disciples, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in among them and said, Peace be with you. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. My Lord and my God. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is John 20, 1-31. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After that, the Lord Jesus has spoken to them. He was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied them meaning miracles. Now when they were going behold some of the guards came into the city and told to the chief priests all the things that were done and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel they gave large money to the soldiers saying just say his disciples came by night and stole his body and if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and protect you. So they took the money and did as they were told. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews even until this day. His path to the cross was a torturous one. All those that walked with him left stretched naked on the cross. He was humiliated for all the world to see a criminal's death. This is how the Heavenly Father views sin. Not wanting us to pay such a torturous death, He sent His Son to stand in the gap for sinful flesh. Repeatedly we see how men like Pontius Pilate and the centurion soldier saw that he did nothing wrong. Even the criminal dying next to him believed. The man that knew no sin became sin. Now as he hangs on the cross, Jesus breathes his last breath and dies and resurrects for all. Plagan of Trales, a historian, said during this time that a large and extraordinary eclipse of the sun was miraculous and no eclipse like it had ever happened at that magnitude. At the same time, there was also a great earthquake in Bithynia. 
Bithynia was an ancient region, the kingdom and Roman province in the northwest of Asia Minor. In that land, Plagan said that the earthquake overthrew many houses in Narcissia, which confirms the biblical accounts of the natural events during that time. St. John Christome, uh, Archbishop of Constantinople, John was an important early church father. He is known for his preaching and public speaking and was among the most prolific authors in the early Christian church. Now he wrote, The creature could not bear the wrong done to its creator. Therefore the sun withdrew his rays that he might not behold the deeds of the wicked. The sun was so distressed at seeing the creator, the son of God, Jesus incarnate, die that it withdrew its light and went dark. Now imagine the people standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus gave up the ghost and the entire sky went black. When they heard Jesus speaking before he died, believing that they had heard him calling on Elias or Elijah, for Elijah was believed to have some relation to the prophesied Messiah. There were two veils in the temple, one before the holy place and one before the holies of holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant rested. This was always kept closed, the curtain before the holies of holies. No one could enter the holies of holies except the high priest Caiaphas, and the high priest could only go in once a year. The veil was torn at the death of Jesus. It was at that time that the priests would go in to do service by opening the outer veil and during the time of prayer. And at this time, the priests rolled back the curtain to the outer veil and they looked in and they saw that the veil before the holies of holies, the Ark of Covenant, was torn from the very top to the very bottom. Now this veil was of immense bulk extremely heavy, so the veil could not just be easily torn. The tearing of this veil meant that now the separation between God and mankind had been torn down. This meant that the death of Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, had torn down the separation between mankind had with God. Now, not only did Jews have access to the Almighty God, but so did everyone else, if we so choose. Access into heaven was made open by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now consider the centurion standing at the foot of the cross as Jesus died, said, surely this is the Son of God. The centurion's job was to make sure that the punishment was carried out, meaning he was there to witness Jesus dying. That centurion's job was to witness the death of the accused. When he saw the powerful natural events, the fact that Jesus prayed for those that were crucifying him, and that he was calling on the Heavenly Father while he was dying. Not much has been mentioned about this centurion at the foot of the cross, but clearly he saw something in Jesus that all the other Jews never paid attention to. Jesus experienced a horrific death on the cross, but he did not stay there. He stayed in the grave for three days and he rose again. Let us not forget what this holiday, Easter, really represents. But really, we're not celebrating Easter because Easter is a pagan holiday. We're really celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never forget how God views sin, for Jesus became sin through his death for us. Jesus' death is the death we all deserve. All praises to the King of Kings for standing in the gap for all of us, that we may be called the children of the Most High God through His sacrifice. Righteousness is not a thing. Righteousness is a person. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement of our peace. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. This is the word of the day. And I am Pastor Michelle Parks. I pray that you have enjoyed this message and it brings you closer to your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Please like and share and by all means subscribe to this channel. In this way you assist me in spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by your many likes. Remember to click the notification bell and you will be notified every time I upload a new video. Please assist me by sowing a seed and in that way you assist me and bring a better caliber of videos to you. May you be blessed and fruitful in all that you do. Until next time, blessings and shalom. Have a great day. Thank you.